I've run OpenStack, I've run vSphere, and now I'm trying out Proxmox. If you guys didn't know, I do have my own home lab. This is it right here. Two six core CPUs per unit down at the bottom, meaning that they're 12 cores each or 24 virtual cores. And they each have 96 gigs of RAM in them with around like 500 gigabytes rated system drive and then four terabytes for the virtual space. Combined, we're talking about four, eight, 12 terabytes of provisionable space with 30 something cores. After I got these machines, I decided that I wanted to get some more machines that were a little bit smaller that didn't cost as much. I see some of you guys talking about electricity and how many watts and stuff like that. These are eight core, uh, 32 gig RAM servers with two terabytes of disk space in them each. The machines that we are going to be running Proxmox on today are my 610s down at the bottom. I did go a little further, uh, meaning that I actually went ahead and installed Proxmox on these machines. You could see that uh, this is the UI. This is the UI you get with Proxmox after you after you set it up. I was very impressed by what you kind of get out of the box here. You get this ability to be able to see, you know, uh, the actual status of your machine. Uh, it gives you some nice metrics that you're able to take a look at over periods of time. So there's a lot of features in it. And to be fair, I haven't really gone through everything yet. Proxmox actually lets you run VMs and containers. However, I want to be clear. These are not the kind of containers that you think they are. These are actually LXC containers. First thing we need to do is we need to set up a cluster. You can see here, I'm logged into R61003 here. I'm logged into R61002 here. And then I'm logged into R61001 here. But you'll notice that I don't see each of these in my UI over here. Like I don't see R61001, 0203 over here. To make that happen, right? What we need to do is, is we need to cluster them. We need to effectively connect these nodes together and make it so that they're all communicating with each other, sharing all of their data. And so to do that, you would go to the cluster setting in the data center. So what we want to do is, is at least on our first node, R61001, we want to create that cluster. And then on the other nodes, we will go to cluster and then we will join cluster. Basically, when you go to create cluster, you get the create cluster settings and it asks you a couple things. It asks you the cluster name and then it act, uh, it also asks you the cluster network or the network that you want to use to have all of your cluster communication over. We're just going to call it Alta 4 LLC. Um, I'm going to say that it's on link zero, meaning that it's on the link that's already there. Then you get, after you give it a name and select your network, you click create and it's off to the races setting up all of the cluster stuff. So once you click create, uh, the task viewer will come up once it says task. Okay. That means we're all good to go. And if I come over here, now I've got my cluster set up. How do I join another node? How do I make it so that R61002 actually joins my cluster? So I would click join information here. And then once I click join information, I would be given a copyable string that gives you like a, a bootstrap string that you can copy. And then you can go over to the other node and click join cluster with it. You can see here, it says copy information if I wanna copy that information. And so if I click copy information, I now have it available to me in my clipboard. And then I go over to Proxmox virtual environment on R61002 and I click join cluster. You basically paste in that cluster information and then you click join. Once I click join, you'll see here that I got another task viewer on R61002 and you'll actually notice that I'm seeing my cluster get or my node get added on R61001. Now we've got R61002 added and you can see now on both nodes, I see both sibling nodes. Now they are fully clustered. If I reload this page and both of my nodes are now here and available to me. And I just did the same thing with R61003. We now have a completely clustered setup. This is awesome and it's entirely free. The next thing I wanna do really quickly is, is I wanna set up the hard drives because we don't want to use the local LVM. We know we have four terabytes per machine just sitting there <laughs> available to us that we can use, but we haven't created our thin pools for them. What's LVM? Logical Volume Manager. You can have a whole bunch of physical drives and LVM will split those drives into smaller volumes that you can then use that act like physical drives. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to click on R61001. I'm going to click on LVM Thin because I want to create a thin pool. And you'll notice that it goes ahead and populates it for me automatically. So I'm going to call this one virtual, and then I'm going to click create. So there we go. Now I've got my four terabytes of disk space available to me uh, now. At this point, I would say, let's get an ISO, right? And let's set up a VM. You might be like, okay, cool. I have the ISO. 
but how do I how do I use it with a VM, right? Like how do I actually get that set up with a VM? This is where you would actually go to the UI and you would use that local storage. So if you want to provision something, you first need to upload that ISO image. And I'm gonna click upload. And you'll see here that this actually gives me the ability to upload an ISO so that I can easily use that for my VMs. And now the ISO is being uploaded from my local machine onto the server so that the server can now bootstrap these VMs. It's going to do the import for me and copy the data to the actual system. So, well, now that I've got my ISOs, I can actually create a VM. So I'm just gonna click on data center again so that I can see everything at the top level. And in the top right hand corner here, we're gonna see a little button in blue. So if I click create VM, so it asks me what node I wanna use first. And so I can say, okay, my R61001, I'll put it on that node since that's the one that I wanna start with. What I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna actually set up a uh, a Nomad cluster. If you've never heard of Nomad before, it's kind of like a Kubernetes alternative. It gives you the ability to kind of run containers very simply. So I'm gonna say Nomad 01, I'll hit next. It's gonna ask me for an ISO image. I'm gonna say I want Ubuntu live server, hit next. I'm gonna keep all of this default. So I'll hit next. Next thing is it's gonna ask me for my disk space. So I'm gonna keep everything the same, except I am gonna change the storage. What I wanna use is I wanna use that virtual four terabytes of space that's available to me. And then I also wanna give it more disk space. I wanna give it hundred gigs. Click next, sockets, one, cores, we're gonna set it to two. I'm going to give it at least, you know, a good amount of space. So we're going to say two cores, right? Memory, do this, 4096. So we'll give it four gigs. Network, we're going to keep this pretty much all identical. This means that I'm going to create a VM that will exist on my network just like any other device does. Okay, and then we get to the confirm page. So I'm going to click finish and it's going to create that VM and we're done. So now I should be able to go over here, click on that machine. You'll see Nomad 01 with 100. It is currently stopped. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to manually set up this VM. What does that mean? Well, it means that I'm going to click the play button, right? And then I'm going to go through the process of booting into the ISO, giving it a username and password, blah, 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 like doing all that. And then eventually the, uh, the operating system will be installed. I'm going to go ahead and start this VM and I'm going to go to console. And so you can see here, I'm literally in the boot up screen for install Ubuntu server. So I'm going to hit enter. I'm just going to go through this process really quickly. I do want to make sure OpenSSH is there. So I hit the space bar to enable it and then I hit done. So now we could see that Ubuntu is actually being set up on this VM. So now the machine's booting up. Now what we're going to do is, is we're going to set up the other two. Two hours later. We have all three nodes up and running. So we have Nomad 01, Nomad 02, and Nomad 03. What's also really cool is, is these are nodes spread across each one of our cluster nodes. If you really wanna like get into this stuff, I mean, honestly, I think three little Raspberry Pis is super, like a super great way to start. You don't need these crazy server racks and stuff. Three little Raspberry Pis could still give you high availability. Uh, next thing we wanna do is we wanna set up Nomad. I'm gonna go to Nomad and I'm gonna go through its install process here. So we're gonna log in and we're gonna hit enter. We're gonna do this on all the nodes. That's the first one. Here's our second one. Here's our third one. Then what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna add the repository and then we're gonna install Nomad. So the Nomad has now been installed, but it's not running yet. It's just been installed. So the next thing we need to do is we actually need to set up the configuration. One of the things that makes Nomad really nice is it's really easy to get a cluster up and running. I only need one config. All you really have to do is tell it where it's trying to connect to or that first node that it's trying to connect to and then it will take care of the rest. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do vim etsy nomad nomad hcl. So you'll see here that they give you a configuration by default. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy in mine and then I'm just gonna delete the existing one. The server configuration is what everything talks to. The client configuration is what it talks to. So what we're basically saying is I want my Nomad cluster to have a server that is enabled. I want it to expect three nodes. I want it to join on the first node and then the server will be set up that way. Once that's done, I also want my Nomad instance to be set up as a client meaning that I want to be able to access the server and then run things and do all sorts of stuff with it. 
So I'm going to save this and I'm just going to do system control status nomad. We could see that it's disabled and the preset is to be enabled. We'll do system control enable and then we will do system control start nomad. And this will actually start Nomad in the background with the configuration that I just gave it. Let's just go ahead and get the other notes back or online. Copy, delete, paste, system, control, enable Nomad, start Nomad. Last one, let's do this and start Nomad. Hey, we're up. So now I have a Nomad cluster set up. Now I want to make sure that it's working, right? Like I want to make sure we're fully clustered. So what I could do is, is I can go to clients. And then look, there we go. Nomad 01, Nomad 02, Nomad 03. I can click on one of these nodes. I can even see host resource utilizations. Nomad is actually pretty dope. Nomad has a much more interchangeable runtime. So what does that mean? It means with Nomad, if I want to run Docker containers, sure, I can run Docker containers. If I want to run a literal binary from the host, I can do that too. If I want to run Java, QEM, U, or raw ex executions, I can do that. Nomad is really nice where it's, it's like a thin layer of runtime where if you just want to run containers, you just install Docker and then now you can run containers. But out of the box, it has exec capabilities, which means that if I wanted Nomad to just run a process on a machine, then it can do that too. So for example, if I wanted Nomad to like, I don't know, run curl and download something, I could do that. And curl could be the entry point or the runtime because exec is the runtime. So this is another reason why I think Nomad's really cool is it's really easy to cluster and you're not just going directly into the container world. You can just literally run processes directly on the host as long as it has that you know binary available to it now if i want docker it means that i have to install docker so let's do that there's a very simple docker script that exists on the internet right there it will install docker and do everything for you easily out of the box okay so let's do this i'm gonna go to clients i'm gonna go to zero one now we don't see docker i'm gonna get the docker script and then I'm just going to do get docker.sh. It's not showing it yet, so it might check in a minute or I might need to... Oh, there it is. Bam. Did you see that? Docker just immediately came in and said, okay, cool. Yeah, I can run Docker now. So let me do the same thing here. So there you go. Docker is now available, right? And if I go to 03, I can see Docker is now available as well. So now I have Nomad and Docker set up on all nodes, meaning that I should be able to actually run Docker commands and docker servers or docker containers right so why don't we run something like let's let's actually run a job now if you've ever ran kubernetes before you probably know about kubernetes manifests and yaml and all that fun stuff with nomad it's similar but it's ran with hcl so if you don't like hcl you're probably not gonna like nomad <laughs> but hcl is the the language for or Nomad. At its core, everything is a job. And so if I want to run a new job just directly from the UI, I can click run job and then I can paste in a job definition and I can even give it like HCL variable values if I want. Now I've already got a template here that I can use and it's a very, very simple uh, Nginx front end. The job is named example. And then I'm going to give it some high level parameters for like where it's going to be scheduled, what type of job it is, and things like that. And then after we have these like placements and, and higher level settings for the job, we then set up the group and you can have multiple groups. This one is I'm going to call front end, right? And then I'm going to say that I just want a count of one for the thing that I'm trying to run. I can do network settings. I then set up a service definition. And then the last one here is our task. And this is it. This is really a very simple job that should give me a random port on a host, which will then make it so that I can access this. So the goal should be that I go in here, I click this, I paste this in, I can click plan. It will make sure that everything is successful and then I can run it and effectively provision it. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to hit run and then we should start seeing things happen. There we go. One running health running successful. There we go. There's my front end, my allocations. And then what I should be able to do is go over to services. We'll see example front end. I can click on that. And then you'll see here, it actually gives me an address and a port. So if I go here, I hit enter. Hey, 
we did it. So let's talk about really quickly everything we have set up here. We're going to go all the way back to the lowest level, which is I am running three servers in my garage. Each one of these servers has Proxmox installed on them and they are clustered. After we did that, we set up VMs for Nomad and then those three virtual machines installed its own clustering service and yeah there we go now now the entire like everything is working the entire stack is set up now but this is a good example of how you can build your own home lab set up proxmox or something similar to it that makes it easy for you to create vms and then once you have those vms take that a step further and say like okay now I'm going to install, you know, a more modern framework or tool like Kubernetes or Nomad on top of that so that I can run containers and other workloads on top of that. I'm happy. And it really does go to show you that, like, if you understand fundamentals and you have the ability to set these things up, you can really go from zero to hero pretty, pretty quickly.